Today we begin a seven-part sermon series based on Esther, the fourth chapter, the 14th verse. And you'll hear that in the reading today during the sermon. The title of the sermon series is, For Such a Time as This, Seven Lessons for Living Through Pandemic Times. Over the next few weeks, uh, these weeks of August and into September, we will take a look at a number of lessons that we can learn. Today, lesson number one, get into trouble. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Since Congressman John Lewis entered eternal life on July 17th, I've been reflecting on 30 minutes of time I spent one-on-one -on -one with him on September 30th, 2015. After working for over six months to set up the meeting, I flew into Washington, D.C. on the last day of my sabbatical in 2015 to meet the iconic civil rights leader. Thanks to my friendship with Congressman Bobby Rush of Chicago, I was granted 30 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, with one of my greatest heroes. As, in, we're, as we're seeing through these days since his death, one of America's greatest heroes, one of the world's greatest heroes. We ended up speaking about many things. We talked about family and life, we talked about Congress and, of course, the Civil Rights Movement. He said his life was defined by getting into good trouble, necessary trouble, trouble that always moves to redeem the soul of America. He said, I was arrested 40 times in the 1960s. I was beaten unconscious. I have been arrested another six times as a member of Congress. I imagine it will happen again if I'm given enough time. But every time I was arrested, I was getting into good trouble. I was challenging unjust laws, unjust practices, and immoral practices. He continued, my civil disobedience came from my faith. Like Jesus, I was laying down my life for others. I was always ready to die on any given day. And at the age of 20, I need to say, that's a remarkable, remarkable statement. I didn't always realize it then, but that nonviolent civil disobedience that I practiced freed me so that I could live my life every day in peace. Faith in God, in Jesus Christ, and yes, faith in humanity was a constant theme as I listened to John Lewis. I asked John, when you were beaten down, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday, 1965, in March, how did you get up? He answered, faith. I had faith in God that he would lift me up, that he would pull me through, through all my beatings and imprisonments and my work in Congress. It is faith that saves me, faith that moves me forward, faith. It is always faith. And he was about that energized as we sat there in his office. Faith, faith, faith. When talking about his late friend and colleague in Congress, Congressman Bobby Rush of Chicago told me last week, John was a transcendent person. He was humble, yet remarkable. He was my friend, and he was one of the most beautiful people I knew. Transcendent, humble, beautiful friend. When he faced the challenges of his life, including growing up in poverty on a sharecropper's family farm in rural Troy, Alabama in the 1940s and 50s, John was able to face life as it came to him and embrace it move beyond the obvious challenges of poverty and racism and hate that he encountered almost every day. He was able to embrace the fullness of faith and patience and study and truth and peace and love and reconciliation, which is the 
emphasis of his book, Across That Bridge, Life Lessons and a Vision for Change, John Lewis faced whatever came at him and he marched through it to victory. John Lewis was a transcendent person. So how does a person do that? How does a person face the ugliness and awfulness of life and overcome it all? Moreover, how do we learn from them and embrace their lessons of grace and peace under fire? How do we do this? Let me, let me get even closer to each one of you. When time of hardship comes to you, personally or professionally, how have you responded to the challenges, the questions, the decisions, and the obstacles placed before you? For all the children and teens who are listening today, think of this. When you see bad things happen, when bad things happen to you or they happen to others around you, how do you react? How do you respond? Do you respond by doing a good thing in response to a bad thing? By doing the right thing in response to the wrong thing? Or do you react and respond by striking back and creating more of a rolling bad action? It is my hope and my prayer that you will, like John Lewis, stand up, speak out, and make a difference in the world. I hope you make good trouble, necessary trouble. And I have to tell you, it's a lot to ask of any one person to make good trouble, to, to stand up, to speak out, to do the right thing. It's a lot to ask. But we have lots of great examples in the Bible on how to do just that. And John was a man of biblical import. He was grounded in Holy Scripture, and he was led by the fullness of, of people like Esther, Queen Esther. As a young woman, Queen Esther saved the entire Jewish community in Persia from extermination. Listen to her story, one of the truly great scriptural measures of how to respond in the face of crisis. Esther was only one of two books named for a woman, the other being Ruth. Parenthetically, Esther is one of two books in the Bible in which God is never mentioned by name. The other one, as you all know, is Ecclesiastes. Now, Esther became queen of Persia in 479 B.C. Unbeknownst to the king, Esther was a Jew. Although Esther never deceived her husband about her religious faith, he didn't ask. She never spoke of her love and allegiance to God and to the Jewish people. Her Jewish heritage didn't seem to matter until the arrogant and evil Haman used his power to bring an edict of death upon all the Jews in Persia. Esther's uncle Mordecai, who had raised Esther as his daughter since her parents had died, stepped forward to appeal to his adopted daughter. Mordecai says to Esther in the fourth chapter, verse 12, don't think that just because you're living in the king's house, you will be one of the Jews to get out of this alive. If you persist in being silent at a time like this, Help and deliverance will arrive for the Jews from some place because God never abandons us, but you and your family will be wiped out. Who knows? Maybe you were made to be queen for such a time as this. In other words, in every moment, God is present. In this moment, God has given you the opportunity to step up, to step out, to lead. Will you embrace this opportunity, this moment? Will you be the leader God has called you to be? Or will you shrink from your calling, from your responsibility, and will you hide in silence? 
These are powerful questions that hit each one of us and can indict any one of us in this hour on any given day. God knows the answer, but do we know the answer? Like Esther, when we are called upon to step up and speak out, do we do it? Or do we turn and walk the other way? Do we shrink away from responsibility? Do we move away from purposeful living? Do we hide in silence? Do we avoid? Do we evade? Do we disappear? That's what we could choose to do. And the power of this story that is, if we do that, God will find a way to answer anyway. But God would prefer, as he prefers with Esther, that in that given moment, stepping up, speaking out, and making a difference would be the choice. This paradoxical truth both stings and reassures. Any one of us can walk away from leadership and saving others who need our help. But God won't walk away. In this story, God will not walk away from the salvation of the Jews. If Esther fails to respond on behalf of her people, God will find another way, another person. But I'd like to believe that if we're getting into good trouble, we would actually see ourselves in the place and presence of one who can respond to good trouble and to create it ourselves. In the face of this challenge, Esther makes a choice to get into good trouble. She chooses to save her people with her own style and her own plan. She doesn't do it the way Mordecai and some of the other guys would do it. She throws a party. She throws a party, and she devises a plan at the dinner party to expose the evil of Haman's plan to destroy the Jews, something the king apparently didn't know about. When Haman's plan is uncovered, Haman is hung. Mordecai is elevated to the right hand of the king as a trusted leader. The Jews are saved. And in the generation that follows, Esther's son, the king's son, Darius, becomes the king. And he returns the Jews from exile in Persia to return to the Holy Lands. Darius oversees the rebuilding of Jerusalem, of David's city and Solomon's temple. In the end, Esther not only saves her people from extermination, she births the heir who leads them home from exile to their homeland. By stepping up in a crisis, Esther saves the people in this day and forevermore. This story calls all of us to such a time as this. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Throughout time, God has used the gifts of common and uncommon people in times and places through which and in which they have made a difference in history. Like Esther, some of these people are known to us, for their stories are written down. Others, we do not know their names. We see them in pictures and wonder, who is that? And how did he or she get there to stop? something from happening that would have destroyed whole numbers of people. How did that happen? All of them responding in some way or another to God's call at such a time as this in their world. John Lewis once said, if we want to build a loving community, we cannot shy away from responsibility to lead. The church must be the headlight, not the taillight. There is too much suffering in our world, and I don't think the forces of history will be kind to us if we fail to speak up and speak out. Ouch. In pandemic times such as this, this is how we respond. We respond as John did to the challenges ahead of us. We become the headlights and not the taillights. What lessons can we take away from Esther and John that we can apply to our lives right now? Well, sociologist Rayshon Ray, Dr. Rayshon Ray has helped me out and will help all of us out with some lessons that he shared through the Brookings Institute this week. Five lessons we can learn from John Lewis. Here they are. They apply to each one of us and can help us through these pandemic times to get into good trouble. First of all, vote. Always vote. Your vote matters, John wrote in a tweet on July 3rd, 2018. 
If your vote didn't, why would some people keep trying to take it away? Hashtag good trouble. Check it out. Lewis sent that tweet, and it highlights his life's work, equitable voting. One major part of the civil rights movement was black people gaining the right to vote. This finally occurred with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but Shelby versus Holder, Supreme Court decision just seven years ago, 2013, essentially gutted the Voting Rights Act and paved the way for widespread voter suppression that has happened nationwide and gerrymandering that has created a total mess. This is why it is imperative for Congress to act swiftly to pass, right now, write it down, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to ensure equitable access to the polls. Congress must honor John Lewis's legacy and ensure an equitable participation for all in the democratic process. As Lewis noted, the vote is precious. It is almost sacred. I almost died a number of times to defend the vote. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have in a democracy. So, get into good trouble. Call your congregational leaders now and make sure all Americans have equi equitable access to the polls this November and forever. Second, you are never too young to make a difference. Esther was just in her early 20s when she heard Mordecai's challenge and responded to God's call. John Lewis was 17 when he wrote a letter to Martin Luther King and said, I'd like to meet you. So Dr. King sent him a round trip ticket from Troy, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama, and he came walking in and he says, you must be the boy from Troy, and it stuck. That was his nickname for John Lewis ever from that moment on. At 23, John was the youngest person to speak at the March on Washington on August 28, 1963. Elder civil rights leaders tried to quiet his words. He was critical of the Kennedy administration and the slowness by which broad-scale legislation, ch legislation change was occurring at the federal level. He was also critiquing civil rights legislation which did not address police brutality against black people. Wow! His speech addressed that. And here we are in 2020 dealing with it again. Imagine how this moment in the movement up for black lives may have been different today had the elder civil rights leaders not clamped down on him, if they trusted and listened to the young John Lewis. Lewis's youth gave him a vision for a more transformative society than, than was socially acceptable at that time. In some cases, he, he had suffered in ways that none of the others had. He'd been beaten almost to death several times. John Lewis's legacy teaches us that age is nothing but a number. And young people have to be the change that they want to see by pushing and forcing older people for equitable change. And I am ready to be pushed. If you're listening, come and push me. The truth is that older people are often socialized in the current arrangement of society, and we can't envision a radically different world. So we need the vision of youth to force us to move forward, to push us to the brink of things that need to be changed. As John Lewis said, I want to see young people in America feel the spirit of the 1960s and find a way to get in the way, to find a way to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. Are you hearing this? Young people can and should push for transformative change and hold us accountable, he said. By the way, it won't surprise you that John Lewis, at the time of his death, had a huge youth following across the nation and the world. His graphic novels, March 1, 2, and 3, were used as required reading in 15 universities across the country for entering level freshmen. And by the way, he had so many requests to speak at colleges, he never had enough time to fill them all. So I recommend that all of us get March 1, 2, and 3, these graphic novels, read them, and then once we've you know, bound them up and everything and put notes in them, then pass them on to our children and grandchildren and anybody else. He was the most sought after congressional speaker on college campuses to the end of his life. Third, speak truth to power. 
Speak up, speak out, and get in the way, he said. He taught us the importance of speaking up and speaking out. We have to be willing to speak up about injustice, always, no matter what the cost. Lewis stated, when you see something that is not right, something that is not fair, something that is not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. This motto should apply in all aspects of our lives. And John Lewis epitomizes it. He encourages us never to be silent. He was adamant about supporting free speech, but he was also adamant about condemning hate speech. He said, I believe in freedom of speech, but I also believe that we have an obligation to condemn speech that is racist, bigoted, anti-Semitic, anti-LGBTQ, or hateful in any way. Fourth, become a racial equity broker. John Lewis personified the transition from political activist to politician. For 34 years, he served his district as a congressman. He was a racial equity broker. A racial equity advocate speaks up and speaks out and stands in the gap and sits at the table to advocate for people who cannot advocate for themselves. There is a saying, if you are not at the table, you are on the menu and someone is eating you for lunch. Shirley Chisholm said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. John Lewis realized that to make transformative change, he had to be at the table and bring his own chair a lot of times. Once at the table, John realized that he needed to help draft the documents that got discussed at the table that led him in so many ways to become an elected official who was a racial equity broker. He altered, he deconstructed, he reconstructed laws, policies, procedures, and rules that inhibited racial and economic equity and equality. Finally, never, never give up. When John Lewis was elected to Congress in 1986, the first bill that he put forth was the creation of a national museum to chronicle the history, culture, and successes of black Americans. He said, black history is not a part of American history. It is in the mainstream of American history. The culmination of this bill was passed in 2003 and the museum opened in 2016 as the National Museum of African American History and Culture. You see, John Lewis taught us persistence. He taught us that when a person has a transformative idea, they should never hide from their idea. They should never put it on the back burner. Instead, they should push those ideas until others get on board. Simply because change is slow does not mean change agents have to move slowly towards it. Lewis was a lightning bolt for equity, social change, and social justice. And we must continue his legacy. We must never forget history. We must pursue equity and get in good trouble. Today's gospel lesson that Mark has spoken so beautifully of in the children's time talks about the mustard seed. Now, some of you are sitting out there and, and saying, I write this off and say, I, I can't be Esther, I'm not a queen. I can't be John Lewis, I'm not a congressman. I don't care. You're you. And with your mustard seed, you can make change. You can plant the seed in the place where it will grow into a full tree. You can do this. Jesus gave us this parable to tell us that nobody is too small, no idea is too insignificant, nothing can stop us from getting into trouble. Plant good trouble. <laughs> Plant your mustard seed in a place where you can make a difference and then water it, care for it, let it grow. So get into good trouble. Get into necessary trouble. In this pandemic time, 
like Esther and John, by getting into good trouble, you can literally save your soul and the soul of the nation. May God bless you and keep you always. Amen.